Of course, as, as I'm sure all of you know, the story of um, Nels Dahlgren is, is also the story of Simone de Beauvoir. Uh, the two of them had uh, one of the great romances of the 20th century. Um, and um, Anyway, there's a, a book that came out last year, uh, perhaps some of you are aware of it, it was by uh, a writer named Thomas Dijon, and it's called The Third Coast. And it's a terrific book, it's, it's, it's about the period between the end of World War II and 1960, when in, in Dijon's concept, Chicago really was the, um, the, the center of, of, uh, of American culture and everything really significant that would affect the future came out of Chicago. And he follows a bunch of stories. One of the stories that he does follow closely is that of um, Algren and de Beauvoir. And um, we invited him, uh, Thomas Dijon, to speak tonight. He wasn't able to make it, but um, he did say it was fine if I could read just from a little bit from, from his book by way of an introduction to um, uh, Gail Schechter, who's going to be um, reading some of, uh, uh, some of Simone's letters to Nelson Algren. Um, anyway, let me see. This is, they met in February of 1947 in Chicago, and um, they had a, a, an explosive uh, uh, romance, but she had to leave very soon after. Um, and this is what Dijon says about the correspondence. From the road, Simone sent her first letters, tentative, not just because her English was stiff and young, but out of a reluctance to see the magic of those 36 hours he rode. Goodbye, she closed a letter in March. I am happy to have met you, and I am sure we'll meet again this year or next year. In late April, she convinced her local youth, that's what she called Algren, to meet in New York. Before she left for Paris on May 17th, this is the second trip, Algren proposed, um, I'm sorry, Algren produced a wide silver ring that he slipped onto her finger. They were married now in their own way. In the sad streets of Chicago, she wrote as soon as she landed, under the elevated, in the lonely room, I'll be with you, my beloved one, as a loving wife with her beloved husband. For her visit in September 1947, Algren took her on the grand tour of Chicago, from the stockyards to the slums, to Syrah's La Grande Jatte. They saw the electric chair. They went to midnight missions and visited Maxwell Street, where she bought wide shoes at Big Jack's. <laughs> at Poole's Healing Services on Lake Street, he gave her a bottle of compelling oil. Precise and perceptive, de Beauvoir proved to be one of the most astute observers Chicago has ever entertained. And this is from her journal. In the evenings especially, a provincial poetry floats through the streets. At the corner of a dead-end street, children smoke and whisper about their plans. Sitting on their porches, Women watch the city lights on the horizon. The groaning of the L shakes the silence. The foliage of a tree rustles. A cat rummages in a trash can. The slightest sound lingers. You feel far, far away from human ventures and follies in the heart of a calmly ordered life that repeats itself day after day. Yet tomorrow morning, you'll read in the paper that they found a corpse cut into pieces in one of these alleys that two men slid each other's throats in a nearby bar, that a barkeeper was shot down with a revolver two steps away. The sweetness of Chicago nights is deceptive. The two of them said goodbye September 24th with plans for a long trip together in the spring down the Mississippi. While she waited at Midway Airport, a messenger handed her a white corsage from her gentle wild man. Sartre's confrontation with de Gaulle loomed. In tears, Nelson's loving little frog headed back to Paris and her work. And now Gail Schechter, who's a, um, an organizer and activist, she's the, the head of Open Communities, uh, which fights the good fight for fair and affordable housing in the northern suburbs, will be reading uh, some of uh, Simone de Beauvoir, de Beauvoir's letters. So please greet Gail Schechter. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you very much. So you got a little bit of an introduction. So Simone wrote over 500 pages worth of letters to Nelson Aldrin, uh, known as a, a, one of the great feminists, author of The Second Sex, companion to, um, to Sartre. She nonetheless was, um, yes? She nonetheless uh, 
was a lover to Nelson Algren from about 1947 to 1964, although the first three years were really the most intense. And uh, in culling through this, I thought that one of the best ways to go through this book uh, for you is simply to uh, start with all the salutations to Nelson Algren that are in this book. And just the first four, the first four salutations, which are simply over the course of three months worth of letters, give you a sense of how quickly their uh, relationship um, advanced. So you have, Dear Nelson Aubrey, Dear Friend, My Precious Beloved Chicago Man, <laughs> My Beloved Husband. <laughs> And then here are chronologically just some of the, the highlights. Mon bien aimé, dearest Ed Aldrin, dearest, Nelson, my love, my own Nelson, good morning, dearest, my beloved one, my dearest husband, my beloved Nelson, my beloved nice man, my own Nelson, my beloved crocodile, good night, my love. Nelson, my beloved faraway husband, darling, honey, my own crocodile, darling, dearest Mexico husband, my own local pretty man, good night, honey, darling, my dearest next month husband, so Nelson, Nelson, mon amour, my naughty husband, dearest dear you, poor dear you, Dearest lazy you, dearest silent you, dearest sweetest you, Nelson, my only love, dearest Division Street Dostoevsky, <laughs> dearest man with the golden arm, dearest modest you, my man with the golden brain, Nelson, my dangerous beloved you, my poor dear me's beloved one, Dearest shameless piece of Wabanzia pimp. <laughs> Sweetest darling you. Dearest lazy crazy pimp of mine. Sweetheart, darling <clears throat> smart you. Nelson, my sweet beloved man with the golden heart. Etc. down to. Subversive beast of my heart, my faraway love. Dearest nutty king of nothing. Dearest flower of Istanbul. My own old owl, dearest you, your own Simon. So Simon's letters can be described in her own words to all these, so all these letters in 1952 when she talked about her a uh, book that she wrote about the people she describes in, in, in her letters. In her words, these are the hopes and disappointments, friendship, love, and quarrels among some French writers, their relationship with politics in general, the Communist Party, especially their problems nowadays about writing. I put a lot of things in it. Travels, drunken evenings, young and mature people, some of Kessler, Camus, and Sartre, and myself indeed. And, and you have that in these letters. But I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the love between the, the two of them and what she thought of his writing. Um, so I'm going to just cull a little bit. So she talked about the movie The African Scene, and I think it speaks to what she's really thinking. So she says, I do like The African Queen very much, maybe because it's a middle-aged people love story. In my idea, their first kiss is very moving, much more sexual and sentimental. And then she talks about Ethan Frome. Um, uh, Aldrin loved Edith Wharton, and he gave her a copy of the book. She says, I think the love between Ethan and Marjorie is very deeply felt and expressed in a very moving way. I like chiefly the dinner in the quiet home when the wife is away. Edith Wharton succeeded in giving a very rich poetical meeting to this one free evening. It is very daily, very simple. It sounds true, and the unspoken quiet love sounds true too. I like the idea of a deadly love, such an important essential love, being lived in half-consciousness in a daily unimportant way. 
the contrast between the torrid tearing, the impossibility of departure, and the gentle, ordinary comfort in each other seems very true to me. And that's because this is, I, this is me, this is because this is what she experienced with Nelson Aldrin. And I want to read to you a paragraph here. I love you so much tonight, among all nights, when I so much love you. It is a nice night, nearly mild and misty. Sweet misty nights always make me think of you. I don't know why. Paris was beautiful in a secret, sad way. I had a very good day because I went to a painting exhibition, which was wonderful. Did you ever hear of Paul Clay? Yes. <laughs> cool. <laughs> he was half German, half Swiss, and died in 1940. He did the most poetical, appealing painting I ever saw in my life. I knew him a little before, but there were never many shows of him because during the war he was forbidden by Germans as decadent and so on. There were more than a hundred pictures today, a whole life, a whole man. It is very fancy painting, sometimes abstract, always irreal. Yet when you go out and look at the real night, you think, yeah, it's just like it. The same beauty, the same humor, the same sadness and joy in the red and green lights of the real night and in the real paintings with wonderful colors. So I feel good tonight. I think it is a good criterion for literature or art when it makes you feel deeply good for having tasted of it. Your books have this precious quality, and that is what you ask for man or woman too, is it not? Just to feel, well, the world is, the world is worth having been done <coughs> since this can happen in it. This picture, this book, this love, this smile. Indeed, she was moved by Aldrin's writings, especially Never Come Morning. So here she's talking, she actually translated the book. You drive me crazy with your bite check, that's a character, or Sartre does, he helped to translate it. I don't know. The other night, began working with him at 10, and he did not let me go to sleep before 2. His hair disheveled, red in the face, and a crazy look in his eyes, cursing Guillaume, who was the original translator, and sometimes you, too. She spent 10 hours a day translating this work. Well, yesterday evening, each of us was through with his own part. All we have to do is survey each other's part now, and you have the last touch, it will be more pleasant. Within three days, your book will be ready to print. Honey, a real masterpiece of translation. Sartre gave it a very fine title in the end. Le matin se fait attendre. It sounds poetical in French. It is nearly the same meaning of never come morning. Exactly, it means morning is long to come. You have to wait long to get to morning. Morning is long delayed, you see? The point is it sounds quite like a French title, not a translation, do you agree? And then she said, dear far away glamorous you, so our child is born at last, was delivered to Guillaume, and they'll give it to Gallimard, the publisher, tomorrow. A bit amazed when he saw not a single word of his translation was left. <laughs> he suggested I should put my name with his, but I did not accept this honor. Are you glad to have got a French child? So to wrap up here, um, the other big piece in Simon and Nelson's love was that there were two supporting characters. And it's not what you think. It's not Sartre, and it's not the various women that Nelson was with or even married and even divorced. It was, in fact, Chicago and Paris. And I want to read to you um, some poignant uh, lines about that.
I am sitting in a lonely bar, little bar, hearing bad music with American bad songs and drinking good scotch, and I feel very poetical. The strike is going on, many people on bicycles and on feet in Paris, and there are all kinds of old trucks and cars to take people from one place to another. It is not very disturbing for me because I nearly always stay in my saint germain des Play neighborhood. Always a lovely autumn smelling of burnt leaves with sun through gray clouds and strange yellow light about the Seine. I think of the moving shadow of the tree in the Wabanzia kitchen. A few minutes ago, I was just thinking how these 10 days we spent together must be different for each of us. Of course, you saw me when I saw you. In a way, it is a difference, isn't it? But then you saw me loving you, and I you loving me. So anyway, we were both present to both of us, and it was our love. The difference is rather I came into your home, your town, and your life. It was the same world with just a little frog in it. I landed in a very faraway place, a wonderful, strange, foreign place, your crocodile place. The little home cannot be as precious to you as it is to me, the porch, the tree, the whole street, the whole night coming into our bed all that seems as remote and stupendous as fairyland, and yet as true and sure as my love, as my heart and blood. While we were both happy in our peculiar way, were we not? I do not cry anymore. I feel very lucky and happy. And she also adds here, now, where are you now? When you'll find our little home, I'll be there, hidden under the bed and everywhere. Now I'll always be with you, in the sand streets of Chicago, under the elevated, in the lonely room. I'll be with you, my beloved one, as a loving wife and her beloved husband. We shall never have to wake up because it was not a dream is a wonderful true story which is only beginning. I feel you are with me and where I shall pass, you will pass. Not the look only, but all of you. You take me in your arms and I cling to you and I kiss you as I kiss you. But ultimately, the miles in this transatlantic affair were just too, it was too, insurmountable and so in their work. And so I close with this from one of their early letters, early letters. I want to work, to work very much, because the reason I do not stay in Chicago is just this need I always felt in me to work and give my life meaning by working. You have the same need, and that is one of the reasons for which we understand each other so well. You want to write books, good books, and by writing them to help the world be a little better. I want it too. I want to convey to people the way of thinking which is mine and which I believe true. I should give up travels and all kinds of entertainments. I should give up friends and the sweetness of Paris to be able to remain forever with you. But I could not live just for happiness and love. I could not give up writing and working in the only place where my writing and work have a meaning. It is very hard because I told you our work here is not very hopeful and love and happiness are something so true, so sure. But yet it has to be done. Among the lies of communism and of anti-communism, against this lack of freedom which happens nearly everywhere in France, something has to be done by people who can try to do it and who care for it. My love, this does not make any discrepancy between us. On the contrary, I feel very near you in this attempt to struggle for what I feel true and good, just as you do yourself. But knowing it is all right, I cannot help never, nevertheless to cry madly this evening. 
because I was so happy with you. I loved you so much, and you are so far away. Your own Simone. Uh, next up is uh, someone familiar to anybody who's interested in film in Chicago. Uh, <laughs>